Mr. Chairman, I want to tell you a little story of a local guy done good. By day, he's a biomedical engineer in Pittsburgh. At night, he DJs under the name Girl Talk. His shtick, as the Chicago Tribune wrote about him, is, quote, based on the notion that some sampling of copyrighted material, especially when manipulated and recontextualized into a new art form, is legit and deserves to be heard. In one example, Mr. Chairman, he blended Elton John, Notorious B.I.G., and Destiny's Child all in the span of 30 seconds. That sounds good. I'd say for the past like four or five months, every single weekend, I've done like a Friday, Saturday show. There's a lot of cities and there's just a million colleges you can play at. I think it should slow down. I'm getting a little exhausted. I just like to sit down and work on music. This is my spot. So this is my new album. It's called Night Ripper. On the inside of the album, I kind of thanked all of the artists that I sample. That was part of the fun of the album for people to kind of hunt down how many samples they could recognize and looking through here and even recognizing artist names that they don't recognize on there and trying to pinpoint it. I feel like I did my own work, but I absolutely, you know, owe them all a little credit because they're blatantly on the album and I have a lot of respect for all of their music. You know, the album stirred up a lot of controversy this year. I think people are realizing that I'm not hurting anyone and I'm helping them and kind of why go after someone who's just, you know, clearly they're just trying to make music. So just a little hot sauce. Yeah, at least you get a little dose of Pittsburgh culture in here. Everyone is bombarded with media enough that I think we've almost been forced to kind of take it upon ourselves and use it as an art form. It's like anything, you know. If, if people are passing out paints on the street for free every day, I'm sure there'd be a lot more painters out there right now, you know what I mean? That's exactly what's happening right now with kind of remix culture on the internet. And, um, you know, I don't know, I think the current laws are in a lot of ways just withhibiting, you know, the flow of culture and music. Hello, my name is Dr. Lawrence Ferrara. I have been for about 15 years very actively involved in intellectual property and very specifically about music copyright. The key word in master recording claims is a technique called sampling. If you are a hip hop producer and you're taking a beat from a recorded piece of music and playing with it in the studio and making it into something else, you're always risking being hauled into court and being sued for copyright infringement. One of the most important cases in the United States is called Bridgeport v. Dimension Films. Yes, Bridgeport Music is the owner of copyrights, yes. I used to play the accordion. We have the archive of uh, rap, mostly rap. Uh, they all are mostly sampled, yes. It's just me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I, yes. And, uh, that was my first experience of a sample. And uh, then we started to understand that we may have to listen to some records, to some CDs. Now, the original George Clinton Funkadelic song was Get Off Your Ass and jam. I think I'm going to play it to you. In other words, get up and get up and get up and dance. A great song. If you're familiar with Get Off Your Ass and Jam, it's, you know, it's the opening riff to the song, so it's obviously, it's that thing that cues you to what's coming next. So essentially what we just heard is this. Three notes on the guitar. 
two seconds was taken from get off your ass. It's by the way, it's wonderful to hear learned judges having to deal with song <laughs> titles like get off your ass and jam. <laughs> Dr. Dre and other members of NWA do a song called 100 Miles and Running. 100 Miles and Running, MC Renner, hold the gun in. You want me to kill my motherfucker and it's done it. Since I'm stereotyped to kill and destruct, it's one of the main reasons I don't give a fuck. Basically what they did was they took a portion of the intro guitar riff, um, used it as a loop, but they um, stretched it out so that it, it fit the tempo. So it sounds more like this. Right. So now if you listen, you hear it in the background, it almost sounds like a siren. And they, they, again, they use that in and out throughout the song. It's very difficult to hear that it's been highly manipulated and the context is so different. The phrase de minimis comes from the Latin maxim de minimis non curat lex, which roughly means the law isn't concerned with insignificant offenses. So it was the ideal case to find de minimis use protecting NWA. Now, many people would say well, that's de minimis, but it is not court decided it is uh, illegal to take anything from a recording and it's uh, they also say it's not created it was a wake-up call for the industry as well because they thought oh we are getting away with it and they didn't and they had a rather stark and severe one sentence line, it said, if you sample, you license, period. But this is the way hip hop works. This is the way rap music works. So many people have said that that is the death knell for, for hip hop music. It definitely changed from this to this. And of course we were, uh, as a topic of <laughs> the year, with all the majors, including publishers and record labels. Some people like us and some people don't. <laughs> That's always the case when you have a lawsuit. Is George Clinton uh, uh, satisfied with the way you administer his song catalog? You would have to ask himself, not me. All of this bring us to the, perhaps the most interesting issue about intellectual property and about copyright. And that is, who really owns what? And what is the purpose of copyright? Three, coming to you. Three, three, coming to you. I'm Siva Vadianathan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Culture and Communication at New York University. The best example of the ways in which copyright law undermines everybody's interest is the Grey Album, which was produced by a DJ known as DJ Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse was inspired by Jay-Z's Black Album and the Beatles' White Album. And so he took the vocal track from Jay-Z and samples of the musical bed from the White Album and mix them together in a brilliant way. He released some discs to a few friends who immediately posted the songs on the internet. Within weeks, thousands of people had copies of it. It just came to me one day, just kind of like as an art project I was going to try and challenge myself to do. Um, I had always kind of mixed up different genres of music and everything, and I just hadn't, I hadn't done this particular thing yet, but it just kind of came to me. And I thought, well, maybe I can do it, and it took a few weeks and just did it. And then, you know, after it took off from there, it just kind of got out of hand. It got kind of crazy. Everything he did with that was basically illegal. The Beatles publishing company would not allow this to happen. He agreed not to do any more distribution, but it was far too late. Everybody had it. It was an instant classic. Uh, 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 uh. Now look what you 
what you made me do. Look what I made for you. Knew if I paid my dues, how will they pay you? When you first come in the game, they try to play you. Look my old my bow, you were smell the rings, got some take them. It's culturally as well, you know, you have a very white thing and a very black thing, apparently, and then, you know, it can make, make beautiful music together. It's very corny, very cheesy, you know, and the whole calling it the gray album, all that stuff, you know, but that's what I'm trying to do is change people's perceptions about music and what you can do and things like that. So hopefully I'm getting there, you know, but it's a start. You know. Ultimately, it was probably the most successful album of 2005. If it had actually been sold, it might have been the biggest hit of the year. Danger Mouse never made a dime. Nobody who copied or distributed the music ever made a dime. Beatles didn't make a dime. Jay-Z didn't make a dime. The Beatles uh, lawyers uh, must have made some money, but nobody else did. I'm one of the few people I think has a ton of fans that don't have any product of mine. You know what I mean? So, and that's great because it's not like it's dependent on that. This is the typical setup I use live where, you know, just hours and hours of cutting, trial and error, and then, you know, once I'm actually playing stuff I've already worked out, these are kind of songs in my head where I already, you know, what, you know, I just know I have to mute and unmute on the right time, and I just, you know, have to kind of go. So this is kind of just, you know, a simple drum beat that's really familiar. I'm going to put a cameo drum beat over top of this. So there's two drum beats playing right now. Beat A. Beat B, you can put them together. And then I sampled ACDC, Money Talks, and you can just lay that over top. And then I can put on vocals over top at TI. Whenever I record for an album, I kind of do a live rendition of that, record out of here, and then I take it back in here and kind of edit it piece by piece together. I don't know about anyone else, I'd be happy paying royalties for every sample on the record, but that's not what it'd be. You know, to actually license a sample would cost millions of dollars, which I can't afford. If sampling would be this form of music that you just can't make music off of because you have to give all your money away, that would still be cool. It'd still be this, you know, new way to make music. You know, it's, I think that'd be wonderful. But in a theoretical world, if I could clear every sample on there, and I had a million dollars or a billion dollars or whatever to do it, it would still take me probably, you know, 50 years to go through, you know, the legal hassle of figuring all of that out. And that's just absurd. Okay. So just look at the camera then? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm Dan Glickman. I'm the chairman and CEO of the Motion Picture Association of America. Uh, we represent the six largest motion picture companies. I would not say I'm the boss of Hollywood. Uh, and in fact, if I said that, I probably wouldn't have the job very long. I happen to represent them in Washington and countries worldwide as we try to deal with the issues that we're concerned about. In the U.S. Constitution, there is, which was adopted over 200 years ago, there's only one substantive area of law that was included in the Constitution, and that was protecting creators' rights, because the Founding Fathers in the U.S. said that would be more determinative of about anything else as to how successful a country you would have, is, is that if you had people, imaginative, curious, thinking people who would want to build things, make things, and the theory was they wouldn't do it unless you somehow protected that right. Well, piracy is the unauthorized uh, taking or theft of that intellectual property without compensation. System works just. There are, for example, we have 2,000 points of trade. Of these 2,000 points, 30. Торгуют оригинальными изданиями фирменными. Я аккуратен, я даю интервью. Ой, Ой блин. А как работает эта система? Я извиняюсь за <laughs> ходит охрана, мы будем а, аккуратно прятаться. Ему выделяются деньги на покупку премьеру на презентацию. По интернету отсылает этот видео, часть этого видеофильма в Россию, 
если пиратов устраивают, извиняюсь, что прервался, а цена, то, что им предлагается, они просто высылают по счету там деньги, это система, как называется? Кэшмани, да. И высылается вторая часть диска. То есть... В нашей стране экономика отстает лет на 30, наверное, от европейских. Поэтому у нас все N, у нас это нормально. Притом, самое, самое смешное, что а, лучше всего и быстрее всего а, пиратку выпускает именно точки, принадлежащие сотрудникам правоохранительных органов. Piracy used to be largely the street variety of piracy, you know, the DVDs or the CDs. But now more and more is internet piracy, which is much more complicated than street piracy. A facilitator is a server that acts as a directory or search engine and coordinates the mass downloading and exchange of pirated content between downloaders. The losses to our companies are we figure about six billion dollars a year. We recognize and we know that we will never stop piracy, never. We just have to try to make it as difficult and as uh, tedious as possible. And we have to let people know there are consequences if they're caught. I got a phone call from, from someone that uh, there was a lot of policemen there. And I asked, what the fuck? So I went there with a the cab and the police actually stopped the cab with lights flashing and all. And they wanted to know who I was. And I kept asking, who are you? And they, who are you? And after a bit of uh, who are you in, uh, they finally, yeah, we're police officers. We're here on, on an investigations. They first asked us some stuff about the BitTorrent protocol. Then they asked some stuff about the Pirate Bay and my involvement in it. The obvious goal of the police was to get the Pirate Bay offline and get the, the internet supplier PRQ offline. Well, we certainly wanted the local authorities to know that a replication of copyrighted material was happening and being distributed worldwide. You've got to go after the folks if, if they're actually breaking the law and use local law enforcement authorities to do it. That was the decision they made, but we talked to them. They think that uh, U.S. jurisdiction stretches around the world. It's illegal according to U.S. law, but it's not illegal according to Swedish law. Go, 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 fuck yourself. And the users really appreciated that we talk back to them, tell them that you don't decide over the internet. We, the users, do. Damn it. Now I'm so scared I pissed my pants. Where should I send the invoice for cleaning them? Personally, I see the part Bay as a sort of organized uh, civil disobedience uh, to, to simply force a change of the, the current copyright laws and the, the general copyright climate. There is a growing movement, particularly among younger people in Europe and in the United States, about uh, Collective is free, free is right. Sharing of information should be unrestricted, you know. And if that comes into conflict with copyright, so be it. After three days, the servers were back up and uh, most of the backups restored. Now, the site is virtually impossible to take down. It was quite an eye-opener for them that there's such a large uh, base of popular support for, for file sharing and uh, the general copyright issues. I think in Sweden especially, it's become kind of a cause celeb. There was even a political party that was created because of this. What it handled about was that the Swedish government had laid a place for the pressure from the USA's underhållning industry and got out and crenched the Swedish citizens and put them and put them in the Swedish grundlag. Then people were banned. Så jag satte upp den här webbsajten och släppte adressen på en gång i en chattkanal. Dagen därpå kom det en miljon träffar, dagen därpå igen kom det två miljoner. De började ringa från svenska medier, de började ringa från europeiska medier. 4 januari var min bild i en tidning i Pakistan. Och där någonstans började jag bli smart. Vad är detta? Stanna, jag vill av. 
Piratpartiet för rätten till ett skyddat privatliv. Information från Piratpartiet. 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 Ja, men ta det, ta det och läs på ett, ja. Fildelning, det har ju både för- och nackdelar. Nackdelen är att det är ett upphovsrättsintrång. Om man ska beira det upphovsrättsintrånget fullt ut så får det oacceptabla konsekvenser. Alltså det ligger förslag även på datalagring. Det är ett nytt EU-direktiv så att allting som går på internet ska lagras i upp till tio år. Och det är alltså alla dina mejl du skickar. Dina telefonsamtal du gör ska även lagras. Vanlig, precis. Privat kommunikation. Men du, jag tycker du ska läsa om saker. En gammal intäktskälla för underhållningsindustrin står alltså mot fundamenta som brevhemlighet, meddelarskydd och i förlängningen tryckfrihet. Och det tycker jag är en väldigt oroväckande utveckling och det beror på att de förstår i grunden inte vad frågan handlar om. De tror att det handlar om en viss yrkesgrupp, en yrkesgrupps rätt till betalning. Det är inte det det handlar om. Tittar du då istället på fördelarna med fildelning så innebär det att varje medborgare får all världens kultur och kunskap vid sina fingerspetsar. Vi får alltså en, ett berikande av varje medborgare som vi inte har sett sedan folkbiblioteket kom för 150 år sedan. My love, there's only you in my life, the only thing that's right. What does this music video with Bush and Blair illustrate? It illustrates the extraordinary potential that digital technology has given not just movie studios, not just television stations, but anybody who has a $1,500 computer can begin to use sounds and images from the culture around us to say things about politics or culture in ways that connect directly to people. So tell me about how Creative Commons works, because that is something very different from the copyrights as we know them. That's right. Creative Commons is giving artists a simple tool so they can mark their creativity with the freedoms they intended to carry. Uh, now, it's important that it's artists that are doing this. Nobody's taking any rights away from anybody. Uh, and it's important that they're making a choice about which freedoms they want to associate with their creativity. Can the artists get any payment through Creative Commons? Well, Creative Commons has a suite of uh, licenses. And so, for example, if you license your content under a non-commercial license, what that's saying is you can free to use this for non-commercial purposes, but if you want to use it for commercial purposes, come back and talk to me. Unlike some people in this movement, I fundamentally believe in copyright and its need in the digital age. The only problem is that it's become so expansive and so powerful that it can begin to actually inhibit creativity. Okay. Is all the film magnetic tape or is some of it? No, it's a size 16 millimeters. Film, huh? Yeah. It's nitrate based film? No, no, no. I don't think so. <laughs> That would be dangerous, I think. Yeah. I write books for a living. I know that when my books are assigned in a college, kids take my words and do all sorts of junk with them. But I don't want to file a federal lawsuit about it. I don't want to go into a court and tell them, stop that person from using my work. We all understand in the context of text that you put the text out there, copyright protects you from somebody competing with you and selling the original book, but it ought to be free for people to use and reuse as they want. Those same norms have got to begin to be part of film and music and, and graphics as well. Imagine you could take, uh, you know, when you were married, go back and see all the news stories that were happening on that time, and maybe on an anniversary, be able to take those and mix them into a story about your life that you would give to your spouse, right? This is the kind of creative opportunity digital technologies give us quite cheaply, but the law makes it practically impossible as the law is structured right now. Now, what we should do is just update the law to make the law make sense of these technologies. And, and there are many creative ways to do that to ensure that artists continue to get paid. But the thing to realize is these things sitting on the shelves right now, having content from the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, nobody's being paid for them now anyway. So if they begin to be used in a way that kids can use them in the school and nobody gets paid, then nobody's worse off. But even if you were to you know, put a, a simple system to assure compensation for the use of this, you can actually increase the compensation to the artist who made this work in a way that otherwise they wouldn't be getting anyway. If you 
Go to Africa, the Nigerian cinema is nowadays the largest movie makers of the world. The United States produces 611 films per year. India produces around 900. Nigeria produces 1,200 movies. And the interesting thing is, all that happened without Nigeria having a copyright law. Nigerians are what? In excess of about 120, 130, some say 150 million people. One in five black people in the world is a Nigerian. One in four Africans is a Nigerian. So there's quite a lot of people here. And for a large group like that, not to have any kind of you know, con connection with any kind of audiovisual expression that is peculiar to them, there's a gap in the market. Everybody is looking to Hollywood. They're selling a lot of sex, a lot of violence, violence and all that. We don't make movies like that. We make movies that have genuine human stories, that have real family values, respect, you know, respect for elders, you know, love for one another, accommodation, you know, a whole lot of stuff, you know. We don't celebrate killing and all that. We don't do that. We do make movies that make a difference. As a Christian, I have always believed in sharing. Thank you very much. My right hand of fellowship. <laughs> We can't go to the LA film schools, but we can tell our stories with our own pictures. Oh, they look atrocious, they are, the acting is horrible and all that, but it's at least it's, it's piecing together the stories. So, first show. The first show we have. The American market, they definitely have set the pace for most people. They are the, probably the most advanced in the world. That's accepted. You know, but my people say you can't be taller than me and shorter than me at the same time. You've got to decide what you want to do. So we'll give them, you know, best in the world. Yes, you take that. You take the high end of the market. You take the biggest things in the market. But there's a lot of room to play somewhere else. And we occupy that space quite gladly. The dynamics of making movies on celluloid or 35 millimeters would never work in Africa, would never work in Nigeria. We don't have the structures to support that, we don't have anything to support that. Nigeria has been the first country in the world to accept and, you know, develop um, digital video as an origination format for future films. Nigeria was the first country in the world to make direct to video as the first line of release. The Americans are coming to that now. DVD has essentially saved the, the, the studios in Hollywood but Nigeria went there first. When a film is released, everybody only looks at the uh, executive producer, the person who puts down the money to make the film and reproduce, but the copyright aspect has not really been explored. But we are now trying to give effect or give meaning to that aspect. We have been able to, to start to create that culture of respect for copyright. This market is uh, Alaba International Market. <laughs> Listen while everybody know about the market. We also have uh, like uh, all these important films talking about. The producers are inside the market, so you cannot go and parade their work. The association they will arrest you, so we don't parade Nigerian movies. You can parade uh, foreign movies or those things. Foreign is okay. Since the producer is not here, you can go outside and produce and come and sell at your own price. So that's what's the Piracy has an interesting connotation in Nigeria because see, people tend to think that, oh well, it's criminals who want to do this, people would rather buy the counterfeit copy and cheap copy and all that. The counterfeit copy in Nigeria costs just as much as the genuine copy, so it's not about the money. You know, whether you're buying the counterfeit or you're buying the genuine one, it's going to cost you the same. And that piracy, again, doesn't occur until the genuine copy becomes available. So if we make the effort to put the genuine copy at the time of release in front of the public and they have all bought genuine copies, I wonder who then will be buying the pirate copies. We're also trying to provide solutions to that situation that creates the piracy rather than you know, just pursue people who are counterfeiting things all over the place. You know. If I convict a pirate, the pirate will not put money in my pocket. 
Rather, he will still continue to spend my money that I pay to government as tax. Government will have to feed him. Government will have to clothe him and take care of him even while in prison. We don't want to look at things from the negative angle. We want to approach it from the positive angle. And as we go along, we we'll remove all forms of negativity. Copyright is not about stopping people from using your work, but getting them to use your work legally and giving you money for what they have done with your work. <laughs> God said to Abraham, lift up your eyes. Huh? He said, lift up your eyes and look. Everything you see, I have given you. I'm saying to you today, just lift up your eyes a little. The realities of this economy have required that we should distill our own unique and peculiar method of creating motion pictures. And that we have done. Slap your lap three times. There's a huge chunk of that American market that's right in our ballpark. I'm sure you know that. That's the African-American market. Now, people say, oh, well, fine, you, you, know, I mean, you never connect with them. But the bottom line is this. We have more things in common than even the African-Americans themselves even realize. There are genes in our bodies that respond to each other, that respond to our stories, our songs, our music. That community, essentially, is a market waiting to connect with this Nigerian community. And of course, they can try to shut us out. I mean, but that's not possible anymore these days anyway. Because, you know, when it was up to send a few people to decide what was to show in the cinemas in the U.S. and all that, yes, they could keep you out. But now everybody's up on the Internet. You can access anything you want, anywhere you want, you know, from anywhere in the world. So if I've got product that's valid for guys abroad, I can reach them from here. Society is the biggest competitor for Hollywood, for the music industry, for the publishing industry. So you have this new competitor that is everyone else. So the law has been consistently changed in the past, say, uh, 12 years in order to protect certain very specific interests, especially for the North American uh, cultural industry, in order to prevent society from becoming the producer of culture in itself and for itself. My name is uh, Olivier, I'm the, the head of marketing at VP Records, we're the largest uh, reggae label in the world. This is sort of the heart uh, of the operation. Music starts in Jamaica, comes here and gets spread throughout the world from this warehouse. But the first album that pretty much everybody knows, I mean it sold you know, 6 million units, that was uh, with less airplay and less marketing than this album. And this one sold half of that, so I mean clearly, you know, there's a crisis going on. There's been significant damage done to the value of music by, the, by Napster and all the services where everybody feels that, you know, fuck, what would I pay? And it's true. You can't compete with free. How do you want to compete with something that's free? You can't. We can't. Okay? You know, you need copyright as an incentive to people to create. First of all, we go to the internet service providers and say, look, one of the most important things you have in your business model is music. Uh, when you go and look for new subscribers, you say how important music is. Now, if you uh, believe music's important to you, then respect music and cooperate with those who are uh, producing the new music that you need for your commercial business model. And what we need most protection against is the stealing of our music. Oh, in fact, it's just too, too hot here. It's just like a sauna. So. <laughs> Let me just cool down. Uh. Uh, the figures show that $7 billion in value has been lost in the record industry in the last six years. And while I don't have the exact number, thousands of jobs have been cut. Digital downloading killed the music business. Recently, uh, major record stores have closed, such as uh, Tower Records which is really sad. There is a tremendous turf battles going on. Do you understand the word turf wars? I think that there is no getting away that if the record companies continue to try and stick to their old business model in the new technology, 
it will not work and it will all that will happen is that it will slow down the development if they close down all the peer-to-peer -peer technologies within Europe there will be one in China or in Russia like all of mp3.com or in Kazakhstan and if you close all those down they'll be on Pacific Islands and if you close all those down they'll be on a boat we would like to have penalties which uh, any reasonable person would see as a deterrent so that if you have uh, a first offender in piracy you have to have a, pr a proportionate penalty. If you have people who are major offenders and repeat offenders you have to have something which will operate as a real deterrent and in the world of crime that involves prison sentences. They've started suing people which is not a very great thing to do. Suing your, your fans, and by and large, the people who do the uploading who are the people they sue are the biggest fans. They're the real music fanatics. I think everyone knows the music industry is evil. And that's why when you use LimeWire or Emule, you really don't feel bad about it because this is not industry you want to give money to. I think there's no indication that consumers mind paying artists. I think there's plenty of indication that consumers aren't so happy to pay corporations. We need to find a way to make people want to support the musicians and the, and the record label that help make this happen. And to make this happen, they have to feel good about it. I love going to the record store, buying a CD, and owning this product, because that's what I did when I bought the first record that I love. That's what I did when I bought Nirvana, never mind. I went to the record store with my parents, hunted it down, break it open, read the liner notes, listen to the album. That is an awesome experience, and you know, a lot of kids don't get to experience that, and I question, if you don't have that experience growing up, if you don't have this kind of nostalgic connection and this love for actually you know, consuming music in that way, you know, is it going to be important? The, the, the perception of the value of music by the consumer has declined, uh, and I think what we need to do as, uh, as record labels, uh, and anybody that wants to, to work in music, is really to rethink you know, what we, how we want to sell music. Uh, you know, is the model that uh, you know it's uh, all you can eat, you know, and uh, you just pay ten dollars per month with no limitation on your consumption, uh, but you don't own. So that may be one way. Uh, you know, another way, uh, you know, the French government actually is working on is to uh, to to get you know a percentage of the revenue from the, the telecom operators, cell phone, you know, ISP, and allocate a certain amount to be paid to copyright owners, and then say. Okay, you know, that's going to be the compensation. You'll be transparent to the, to the consumer. You just be added to your phone bill, you won't see it. And, you know, any music you want, just go ahead, consume it. The blanket license, the global license is going to come. If you have 600 million people worldwide paying $50 a year to access and do whatever they like with all the music that's available, you get the current size of the retail, of the record business, over the counter. Why don't they go for it? They don't go for it, I think, initially, because they built up their business, the major labels and the major publishers have built up their business around controlling what we can call the OECD market, you know, the rich world market. And they've they ring-fenced it. And the rest of the world is full of what, we, what they call pirates. You know, I really don't know if down, somewhere down the line eventually everyone's just going to be downloading for free or, or whatnot. You know, I personally enjoy downloading music. I think it's great. I try to buy records when I can. And um, it's just really convenient. A lot of times I own records and I can't find them. My records are scattered over like five households right now. So I'll have to just go on the internet and download something that use it in a song just because I don't want to go through the hassle of going to, you know, try to find it. I think what will not change is the need to market. This, nobody's heard about them. This is probably, you know, millions of dollars in marketing. It's close to zero. You can't just take a product, dump it, you know, on the internet. And, you know, it's this big myth. It, oh, well, the internet is leveling the playing field. What it's doing is that, you know, the big titles, the way we used to market, has changed. Maybe you don't have to own it, but maybe you need to at least listen to it. And whatever consumption, stream, dual delivery, you know, download, mobile, you know, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter.
you have like for instance the Technobrega movement, which is a very interesting movement. Technobrega means uh, the mix between techno, especially like sort of electronic beats from the 80s, and brega means kitsch or cheesy, so it means techno cheesy. Amazing stuff. It's, it's excellent. I love it and it's really great. Este homem muito usado na mão do Senhor nosso Deus, que está orando por você e sua família. Vamos lá? Eu sou produtor musical, faço os remixes de Tecnobrega, lá no meu estúdio aqui em cima. A minha esposa, a minha mãe, Catarina. Aqui o meu pai, onde está trabalhando aqui, ó, fazendo uma prateleira para mim lá para cima, para o meu estúdio. Gente, perto, perto. Beto Metralha, Cyber DJ. Primeiro a gente vai ouvir a música, né? Ouvimos a música na rádio. Aí depois entramos na internet, baixamos ela em algum, em algum site de, de transferência de dados, né? Aí trazemos ela para o computador e, vem, e, e ouvimos ela para ver se tem condição de fazer o remix, né? Aqui no Brega, na verdade, é uma vertente do, do, do Brega Calypso, né? Nossa, aqui de Belém do Pará. O Tecno Brega nada mais é do que a retirada dos instrumentos acústicos. É totalmente eletrônico. Por exemplo, eu, eu sou um produtor musical, mas eu não sou músico. Não dá pra gente utilizar esse próprio baixo dela, uhum. porque é um outro baixo. Uhum. É um baixo de um estilo da Não, música. O, o nosso é tum, 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 tá entendendo? É outro, é outro baixo, então tem que ser criado com as mesmas notas. have like a music producer that has like a recording studio probably a very small one but with good equipment so they invite the artists to these studios and they make the CDs and what they do is that they deliver it to the street vendors so that the street vendors can replicate that so the only people making a profit out of the CD sales are the street vendors the musicians don't expect any money whatsoever from releasing the CDs. Eu pedir a que do comércio eu faço o T e o C do ciclone e o S do super pop. Tudo bem? Tá chique, tá quieto. Ah, aqui você, você encontra a música que você quer, né? É toda selecionada a música num CD. Tem MP3 também que leva 150 músicas, 200 músicas, na loja tudo que gosta aí. 115 músicas. Só a partir da manhã a gente vende umas 300 peças. E é muito procurado quando é... Muito quando é bem selecionado assim. Por exemplo, tem melody, tem técnica. Olha aí, rapaz, já é. Já é madrugada e você não chega A cabeça aquela dúvida onde você está Ando pelo quarto pensando em você Ligo pro celular, não quer me atender Eu sinto um vazio no peito Vou mais muito pena na barba porque eu adoro DJ Que são mortas de gostosa Bate potência gostosa 
A Agra tá gostosa também. The aparelhagem, which is the sound system, is a very important element of the culture of the techno break. So what happens is that the different sound systems compete among themselves about who has the most cutting-edge updated equipment. They already realize that CDs is not a good business model anymore. CDs are merely an advertisement. They organize the parties in the weekend and then you have like 5,000 people going to your parties. And when they do that, then you make money. Aí rapaziada, eu sou o DJ Dinho da aparelhagem Fantástico Tupinambá, a aparelhagem número um no Brasil. É uma música, digamos assim, mais para divulgação do artista. Não, o artista ele não usa aquela música para ele vender milhões de cópias, né? milhares de cópias. Aquilo serve mais para divulgação do artista, para ele fazer aquele pequeno show dele. A música, o brega, primeiramente ele vai ser divulgado na aparelhagem, que é o maior veículo de, de divulgação da música paraense. Começa a, a, a tocar essa música e essa música começa a fazer sucesso. Meu programa. É, a mulher. Eu tô toda suja, toda, toda feia. <risos> Agora a gente está fazendo um remix do, da banda Naus Barkley, da música Crazy. Vamos ver, vamos transformar ela em Tecnobrega. E a história desse cara, do, do Naus Barkley, são dois caras. É o Danger Mouse uhum. e o Silo. O Danger Mouse ele ficou sucesso. É, ele misturou o White Album dos Beatles, o álbum branco dos Beatles, com o álbum do Jay-Z, que é aquele rapper. Só que isso foi... Ele fez isso por baixo dos panos, tipo, ele infringiu o copyright, entendeu? Cara, ele tem muita sorte, né? <risos> pra começar, ele tem muita sorte, tem muita sorte de não estar tá preso também, né? <risos> Mas depois disso, os caras gostaram tanto do trabalho dele que chamaram ele pra produzir o disco do Gorilas, sabe? Gorilas? Gorilas, sei. Sam, my son, together. Gorilas? É, conhece? It's there. Não tem artista, né? Só é desenho. É, só desenho. A maioria das, das músicas aqui são versões. Né? Eu vou bem aqui, tá rapidinho. Elas são, elas são mais fáceis de, de adaptar pro Tecnobrega, pro Melody. Fizeram versão já até do Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses. U2, Ahá. O próprio Pink Floyd. Dire Street. Calma. Essa versão foi uma das que mais pegou de todos os tempos. Assim. Fred Mercury. Queen, né? Essas bandas aí, eles. 
Agora, a questão da, do direito autoral, o próprio artista ele não se preocupa com isso. Ele não quer ganhar dinheiro com o direito autoral, e sim com o um show que ele vai fazer com aquela música tocando, fazendo sucesso. Essa música na Mas, rapaz, se eu vou botar no programa amanhã na rádio, aí tu vai ver. Talvez, tem um DJ, né? Que queira já fazer o remix da É, o remix da versão. Cyber DJ Beto Metralha. their concerts live, so on your way out, you would buy the CD of the concert that you had just listened. The Tecnobrega movement in Belém had been doing that four years before the crisis. The interesting thing about this emerging cultural industries is the fact that they are very innovative in terms of business models. The whole industry, they have a lot to learn. Society as a whole has a lot to, to learn from these emerging cultural forms of production that are taking place in the poor areas of the world. We've all got to rethink the way we do our business. It's not going to be easy. Companies are going to change hands, artists are going to squeal, other artists are going to make a fortune. It's going to be a very turbulent time. Me personally, I'm kind of thrilled, but I guess I'm on edge a little bit, like I feel like I have to hurry up and do a lot of things because I think things are going to change really drastically and you know it's okay if it affects the business side of it, Just hopefully the music won't get screwed up. You need to take a look at your environment, the limitations of your environment, the advantages of your environment and then do things which are peculiar to you and be proud of them. Clearly people will not do things for free. It just is, defies human nature to believe that somebody will come up and they'll paint a picture, they'll do a statue, and they'll just give it away. I mean, it, the, there might be a few people like that, but they probably don't eat very well. Hate to do it, I gotta run. The copyright maximalists, the Hollywood types, say really strict control will grow uh, the industry uh, faster than anything. But in fact, that's wrong. Freedom actually drives a more vibrant, important economy than restriction and control. I think that the culture has changed. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, it was very much an individualistic kind of approach. And with the explosion of the internet, there's been a, a culture of, uh, it's like a mixtape culture, really, where you borrow from that, you borrow from here, you make a mashup on video, you post it on YouTube. Everybody becomes a creator by taking pieces here and there from other people. Forget whether they steal or not, that's a reality that we're going to have to live with for a, for a long time. Okay, I gotta go, man. I gotta go. They're calling you. I think there's absolutely no question that there's a risk that copyright will just atrophy and die. No one will enforce it. We've got to think about it in an incredibly radical way so that it makes sense. You can hear people in their songs on the radio right now that sound riffs that sound just like Black Sabbath, more so than me cutting out Bachman Turner Overdrive will sound like Bachman Turner Overdrive. You know, I can manipulate these sources more so than people ripping off chord progressions can, you know, hide their sources. It's the same exact world, it's just, you know, different musical tools. 57% of teenagers had created and shared content on the internet. That's not people peer-to-peer -peer 
uh, file sharing. That's about 99%. But this is people actually creating material and making it available. To us, the couch potato generation, this is bizarre. I can't imagine doing that. But to them, it's the natural way for them to understand the world and create. Uh, now, you can, you can either call them criminals or call them pirates and use all the tools of, of the law and technology to block them from this creativity. Or we could begin to encourage them by making a wide range of material available that gave them a much better understanding of their past and a much better opportunity to say something about the future. Creativity itself is here on the line and striking a balance between protecting the rights of those who own intellectual property with the right and the rights of generations of future young and old people to create is on the line. This is getting me really pumped. This is a uh, Narles Barkley crazy remix from these Brazilian people. Brazilian music is going so crazy right now. I can definitely chop up those beats at the beginning, always kind of looking for the most, uh, you know, minimal elements. Here's the beat at the beginning. Copy that, paste that. It's all about kind of making it the tightest loop as possible. So this is their beats cut up. So this is just using only the remix So right now I'm making a remix of a remix. I'm remixing the remix. <laughs> so if you want to get kind of experimental on it. I think it goes back to the whole folk culture thing when, you know, remixing a Brazilian remix of an American song, you know, it's the idea of passing these ideas down and you know, Narles Barkley had a specific story to tell and they passed it along and the Brazilians reinterpreted it, add their own beat, add their own flavor. It comes back to some guy from Pittsburgh with a laptop and I'm able to reinterpret the Brazilian version and through that I think it's just a spread of you know, musical ideas, you know, that's, I think that's how right now in this day and age is the most efficient way of you know, having artistic growth is the passing down of these ideas and recycling ideas. So I can chop this up a little more. All right, so here's the chorus part. Let me put that in here. So just that one second. stuff up. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope that I've shed a little bit light. Uh, I hope I've shed a little, let's cut okay. that. I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I have enjoyed presenting it. Thank you very much.